I have probably written today's sermon 30 times with about 20 different biblical references. And in the end, I just kind of sat there one day in front of my laptop and saying, man, this is too much work. So instead of giving you one last meditation, I'm just going to share a little bit of the machinations that float around in my head. The passage that kept coming to the surface is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 13 and 14. It's a very succinct but a very powerful passage, one that I come back and meditate on over and over again over the years. It reads this, Keep alert, stand firm in your faith, be courageous, be strong, and let all that you do be done in love. Do you know what the most common question and comment has been made to me over the last 90 days? Paul, I don't know how you do it. This has been said by some people here that worship in this body. This has been said to me by friends. This has been said to me by colleagues who know that my role, the ministry that I currently serve, is to come into a particular church body, succeed in the other presence. So I have to help you all overcome that. Get accustomed to me only to let go of each other. You begin a relationship with someone new, and I go off to wherever God wants me to go. I have no idea where that is yet. I haven't been approached by anyone, and um, I have no idea what my next gig is going to be. I do know that after I take my son to school tomorrow, I'm going to go back home and I'm going to go back to bed. That much I have determined. <laughs> Yeah, he can deal with it. But the secret or the answer to the question, how do I do this? How do I come in, give myself to a congregation, knowing that it will not be mine for the long haul? I live by this passage. Keep alert. Stand firm in your faith. Be courageous and be strong. And all that you do, be done in love. Because as a transition pastor, what congregations do, either intentionally or unintentionally, or whatever, at whatever frustration they had at James, or sometimes going four or five pastors back if they have longevity in the church, I haven't experienced that here, but I have experienced that at other places, that anger gets taken out on me. I don't take it personally. Because I remember what Jesus said when he was on the cross. Forgive them, God, because they have no honking idea what they're doing. Sometimes we do things poorly and inappropriately. And as a person of faith, we're supposed to forgive when we see someone reacting in ignorance. Where their anger is getting the better of them. Where they're wanting to have clear, succinct knowledge and facts. Almost a soothsaying idea of what's coming ahead and God hasn't released it. That generates anxiety. Anxiety gives to frustration. Frustration gives to anger. Anger gives to action. And the pastor, or the transition pastor, becomes the target. We know that as pastors that's going to happen. But it seems to become aggravated in a transition because all the hallmarks of predictability that you once had in your life as a church left with that previous pastor. And you have someone new coming in who you want to uphold them and has no clue what they are, what their basis is, what they're about. You may think you've explained it clearly, but if someone really wants to understand the biblical and theological justification as to why we do what we do, to say, well, that's what we've always done, or so-and-so started it, is never enough. So we'll ask a question or two, or 10, or 40, until we understand. And because there isn't an automatic clicking, well, sometimes there's some inappropriate phrases and words that are thrown at the transition guy. It's normal. It's being human. So, 
I stood firm in my faith, knowing that eventually we'd get through this, we'd get to a place where we could come together, and we'd be able to move ahead into what we needed to do. I did my best to love you through that. You, next Sunday, are going to start a relationship with a new pastor. He only knows what you've put in your profile. He only has another understanding by the questions he was able to ask on his Sunday that he came and interviewed, and then you called him. But there, that's like the tip of the iceberg. Those icebergs that we see in those nice National Geographic pictures or on the Nature Channel or whatever, we only see the top one-seventh. The rest of it is submerged out of view. He's going to be spending some time trying to understand what's beneath the surface. To understand that other six-sevenths of that iceberg. And he's going to ask questions. And he's going to want to understand. Because he has a surface rendering of what Bethany is. I would encourage you to be patient. More importantly, I would encourage you to keep alert. I want you to be ready and understand that that will probably happen. I want you to expect that God is involved in that inquiry that that pastor is going to make. You, in turn, will need to ask questions also. And when you think that you're getting to a great place, a great starting point, or where you can move together and everything is going to be fine, I want you to understand in being alert that that is when the Satan is going to attack. Now, I don't know if you all here believe in the Satan, Satan, the devil, but I do. I have watched churches that have been cruising and doing phenomenal ministry have a crisis and it all crumbles down. And that crisis came out of nowhere. It always reminds me of the Garden of Eden. After God had made Adam and Eve, placed them in the garden and said, be fruitful and multiply. If we were to put that into common vernacular of today, it would be, I have made this perfect place for you. Go have a blast. And what happened? In that security and idea that everything is fine, everything is wonderful, now we can just go and do, the serpent showed up. More cunning than the other creatures. And he didn't lie. He obfuscated. He clouded the truth. And Eve and then Adam gave in to the decision to not follow what God wanted them to do and followed the way of the serpent. They allowed their alertness to fail them. I would encourage you in the days ahead as you begin this new relationship with this new pastor to keep alert. Allow God, expect God to be involved and to guide you because the Satan is going to do whatever they can to stop you. Because as much as God wants his presence and his love to grow in this world, Satan wants you not to grow. He wants you to fail. He wants you to believe that he can do everything that God can. That you don't need God to do what it is that you need to do. I want you to still live each day as you walk out your door. And even if it's raining hail or you got snow falling in April, don't complain about it. I want you to be in awe of it. Because the power that created the heavens and the earth so many eons ago is the same power that generated that nature that you see of creation when you walk out your door. I want you to keep alert. I want you to stand firm in your faith. I want you to be unmoved because I want you to have an intimate relationship with that which you believe in. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And I don't want you to just have words of belief, catchphrases that you see on social media. I think you also need to 
step up and work towards having a stronger level of biblical literacy. I've read the bio on Dennis. He's a Bible dude. That's what he's going to teach you. Instead of sitting there and saying, well, you know, I've always thought, no. Allow the scriptures to impart its presence into your hearts and minds. Not merely imprint itself upon you, but to allow it to assimilate in, to grow you, to change you, to shape you, to be that congregation God wants you to become. You see, that doesn't happen during the transition period. The transition period gets you ready for that to happen. But in those times when there's resistance, in the times when you feel that the honeymoon is over, in those times when you have, don't have a honking clue as to what Dennis or your fellow brother and sister in Jesus is doing, I want you to fall back on your faith. Focus on what God has done in the presence of people throughout their lives. We've got 66 chapters in a book known as the library. We call it the Bible. That gives testimony after testimony of how God worked in various people's lives. We call them biblical heroes. They were people of faith who stood firm. Sometimes they had to be challenged. Sometimes they had to be disciplined. But in the end, they always understood God knows better. God has a plan. And it's not our place to take that plan of God's and morph it so we can adjust to it. It's our place to adjust to what God's plan is. I want you to be courageous. Be people of courage. Understand, fear is not something that comes from God. Struggling, not knowing, feeling lost and dejected, there are worse things that can happen to us. The worst that can happen is we die. But here's the piece that gives us courage. If we are a child of God, if we are a follower of Jesus, then that death ain't no big thing. Because the God who resurrected his son from the grave has given that same promise to watch over, to protect, to guide, to resurrect us, transform us into a glorified body that will never die Again, when you think about God's presence, God's power, it is easy to be courageous. But if we're not keeping alert and if we're not standing firm in our faith, it's hard to be courageous. But God is there to help us each step of the way. If we're able to keep alert, if we're able to stand in our faith, if we're able to stand with courage, then we're able to exercise true and genuine strength. Not strength that can, you know, push a train car. You ever watch those strongman contests where you see a guy pull a train car with his teeth? My jaw aches watching that. Or you watch them, you know, lift those incredible amounts of weight over their head. My back aches watching that. I mean, I, yesterday, I, uh, day before, I spent the day hanging slat wall in my son's studio. Yes, he has a studio in our house. because I'm tired of tripping over all of his instruments that he has. My back still aches from that, right here. But that's because I pulled a tree out of the ground, you know, 15 years ago and... I'm not sure I've totally healed from that yet. I'm not talking about physical strength. Because physical strength fades. Have you noticed, some of us that have gray hairs, that we can't pick up and move that which we used to 10 years ago? 20 years ago? 30 years ago? Man, I remember when I would be able to take three 
packages of shingles, throw them on my shoulder, and walk up a ladder and say, here, Grandpa, flop them on the roof and say, here you go. I can't do that anymore. (laughs) That's not the strength I'm talking about. I'm talking about a strength that comes from within, when we let God penetrate us and fill us. Then we're able to face that which the world throws at us. And it's not because of a strength that we have acquired. It is because we have allowed the presence of God to truly take root within us, and that presence flowing in. Because when we're overwhelmed, when we're afraid, when we're unsure, instead of reacting rashly and saying, well, we got to do this in order to fix it, we stop and say, okay, God, this is kind of big. What should we do? We wait, and we let God reveal to us what needs to be done. To be strong like that, we have to be alert. We have to have faith. We need to have courage. And none of that is done by our own power. Because everything that we do, in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, in the name of the God who loves us, in the name of the God who sent his Son to save us, in the name of the house that we gather and worship in, the various groups and committees that we serve on, anything that has a connection to God, the one who is with us, should always be done in a tone of love. Not what I, the individual, can get out of this. Not how it makes Bethany the church look. Not how it makes, you know, the fried pickle club look. Not how it makes the flowers look or the candles or the beauty of the building or whatever. It has nothing to do with that when serving. It has everything to do with, have you delivered God's loving grace? The way you threw the change in those bowls this morning. The way you placed your offering in the plates as they went by. The way you said good morning to people you've known forever. Folks that are acquaintances, even the stranger that showed up for the first time. All of that needs to be done with grace and love. And it's not a bad thing every once in a while to check what you're doing and how you're doing it. To step back, look at, and go, hmm, am I really glorifying God the best way that I can? Am I glorifying him as I'm a parent, as I'm a grandparent, as I'm an aunt, as I'm an uncle, as I'm a friend, as I'm a coworker, as I'm standing in the grocery store listening to that person who will not be quiet as they harass the cashier that they didn't get their 10 cents off on their can of peas? Are we standing there and being graceful while we're doing this? Yes, I saw that happen yesterday at the grocery store. Um, We need to be loving. Because it's easy to be judgmental. It's easy to be narrow. It's easy to just take matters into our own hands and say that the way that we see and do is the only way it should be done. But if that's where we live each day, If that's how we come to church, if that's how we seek to grow in our relationship with God and each other, if that's what we expect a pastor to purport in their ministries, then my 26 months of teaching has been in vain. I have not been able to get you to understand that it's not about us. It's about God. Because it's about God allows me to go from congregation to congregation. I have colleagues who have spent their entire career in one church, in one culture, with the same problem happening over and over again. I have colleagues who have probably had a couple of churches, a couple of three churches in our time out of seminary. And I'm talking about the people that I graduated with 20 years ago. It's interesting listening to their struggles and what they deal with. And... Then they ask me about, what am I going through? Well, this past week, you know, this Sunday is going to be my last Sunday where I'm serving. Really? You got somewhere else to go to? No. Really? Yes. 
How are you going to add income to your household? No clue. What does your wife and son think about this? Oh, I don't know. They're more worried about how I'm handling it. But in time, they'll let me know. I'm doing okay at the moment, by the way. And then they say, man, I don't know how you can handle that. I recognize it's not about me. And it's not about you. It's about the one we put on the cross. It's about the ones whose name we gather in. It's about the one who sends us into the world to be vessels of grace and love. And I think one of the ways that hell holds us to that level of engagement that we have with our loving God is to stay alert, is to stand firm, is to be courageous so we can be strong. For when we have those things going on, when we're working on those, it makes it much easier. It's not a cakewalk, but it does make it a little easier to do everything that we do in love. So as we come to the end of this service, as we get ready to sing our closing song, as you begin your new relationship with your new shepherd, keep in mind it ain't going to be perfect. At times, that ain't even going to be pretty. But if you've allowed God to guide you through all of it, and you continue to allow God to go guide you through all of it, then you will move forward. You will grow. Your witness to the community will have impact. And that's what it means to be a church. Taking who and what we know, what we believe, what we hold important and letting the world see it. I have no idea what your future holds. I have no idea how Dennis is going to teach you, how he's going to challenge you, how he's going to encourage and grow you. I have no idea what other crises are bubbling and brewing underneath the surface that you all are going to have to work through with God's guidance. I hope it's not another flood. One is enough. Kelly, don't you hope we don't have another flood? She's the one that found it. What I do know is that if you stay alert... Expect God to be involved. Let God be involved. Understand that there is a spiritual battle going on and you are the pawns stuck in the battlefield. Then you can stand firm in your faith. You're able to be courageous because you have a God that is strengthening you. And if that happens, then you can truly share God's love wherever you go, whomever you're with, and whatever you got to deal with. So let me say this one last time. Take what you've heard. Think about it. Pray about it. And if the Spirit calls you to, apply some of it to your lives. But please do not be afraid, embarrassed, ashamed, or hesitant to let the world that you go in each and every day know that y'all are people of God. Go in grace. Be filled with this peace. Amen.